That would be a good one, wouldn't it? Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I hope uh, you're getting along well. My wife informed me this morning that spring is here, uh, which, as you know, is uh, not my favorite thing to hear. I know people love spring. I don't because it precedes summer, and I don't like summer, okay? Uh, if you know me, you know that I like clouds, rain, hail, um, tornadoes, okay? Anything that keeps you in your house and causes you to be like, you know, I just don't want to go out into the world. So that's kind of where I'm at sometimes. But that's not why we're here this morning. We're uh, continuing our study in First John. We've been looking at the, the 10 tests of salvation or the 10 tests of eternal life. As John takes us through this epistle, uh, he presents to us both these moral tests and also these doctrinal tests, right? How do we know that we know that we believe? How do we know that we know we have eternal life? How do we know uh, that we know that we are saved? This is what God wants you to know. And so John is telling us through these series of uh, tests, I guess is a good word, even though John only uses the word test maybe once. But we know, right, we know that, that there are just things that are going to be able to be evident in our lives that are going to give us confidence, that's what the Bible says, give us confidence and assurance, right, that we belong to God, that we have salvation, and both of those are presented in this epistle, like I said, uh, both morally and doctrinally. Some people go, well, why do we need doctrine, Pastor Sean? Why can't we just talk about Jesus loves us, and we love Him, and He's a really nice guy, and Okay. Well, the reason we need doctrine, okay, because these doctrines are actually what is going to give you the confidence, okay? Let's say we base salvation on love alone. Okay, God says that we are to love because He is love. That's what we're talking about today. Let's base that on love alone. Let's just say that uh, if you want to know you have eternal life, all you have to do is love one another. How does that work out for you guys? How are we doing at that? Are we loving pretty good every day, right? No, we're not. We're horrible at it. Okay? So if love was the only thing you had to hang on to, how well I'm loving my brethren, right? You're going to be you're going to be in kind of a turmoil. You're going to be like, well, some days are good, some days are bad. How do I know I'm saved? How do I know I'm not saved? Okay? And so God comes along with, there's a moral, right, that we love one another, but there's also a doctrinal that says the reason that you are going to love your brethren is because why? Because God loves you and He abides in you. And because He abides in you, guess what you're going to do? You're going to love one another. You're not going to love one another perfectly, but that's not the requirement. The requirement is that you're going to continue uh, to do those things that God has called you to do. And also, here's the caveat to that, has equipped you to do. Okay, And so this is where John's going with this whole thing. We need both of those things. That's, that's just the two wings of an airplane, right? If we don't have one, we can't have the other. We certainly can't fly. And so this is where John is at. And so this morning we're looking at the 10th and final test of eternal life, uh, which is really asking the question, does God abide in me? Remember that word abide is the word meno. It just means, does God live in you, dwell in you? Does He remain in you, stay in you? Uh, we talked about a few weeks ago, do we abide in God? Do we remain in Him, stay in Him? Okay, And so this is what John's asking, right? Does uh, the love of God, does the love of God abide in us, right? And I know the handout that I gave you says, are we abiding in Christ as the test? But you could really, you could really make the argument here in this particular test uh, that we are asking the question, uh, is God abiding in us? Is Christ abiding in us? And the reason we say that is because the whole point John is going to make by the time we get to the end of this today is that we can all claim to know Christ. We can all claim to know His Word. But all of that is irrelevant if God doesn't know us. Okay? And so that really becomes the test. Think about it this way. Uh, we can claim to know the President of the United States. I know it's probably not the best analogy, but I'll just use this. Okay? We can claim to know the President of the United States. We can uh, claim to know all about his history. We can claim to know where he came from. We can claim to know his family. We can even claim to know what he says. 
but they're not going to let us in the White House unless the president knows us. Do you understand? Okay? And so that's where we are in this particular test. And so the whole key to this thing becomes how do we know that God knows us? How do we know that God abides in us, right? Dwells in us. Uh, how can we know and be assured that we truly have eternal life? And that's what we want to know. I mean, it's, these are just things that are basic. You might have been thinking about this all along. You don't even know you've been thinking about it. I mean, you, you stood up one day and you said, you know what, I'm going to put my trust in Christ and I'm going to follow Him. And then the rest of it is guessing how that works. And so God comes along or the Apostle John comes along and he says, hey, here's how we can know that we have eternal life. And this becomes important. In fact, if you look at our verses, we're in chapter 4 this morning, verses 12 through 16. Look at verse 12. This is, this is why I bring this up. Because you don't want to have this kind of softy magoo Christianity. Do you understand? That comes along and says, hey, just love one another and everything is peace and God love you. You, know, you don't want that. Okay, you want to know how you know, and so we can't just make these arbitrary claims about Christianity and everybody's going to bite off on it because John in chapter, or I'm sorry, John in verse 12 there, if you're looking at chapter 4, he says, no one has seen God at any time. So how do we know if no one has seen God at any time, right? Or more accurately, nobody has beheld uh, God at any time, he says. The Aomite means nobody has laid their eyes on God. Why? Because Jesus says God is what? Spirit. God the Father, right? Jesus is the only one that took on human flesh. The Holy Spirit is what? Spirit, right? You cannot see Him. Even the Apostle Paul takes it a step further in 1 Corinthians uh, 6.15. Look at this here. He says, He who is, talking about Christ Himself, talking about God, He who is the blessed and the only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in what? Unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see. Even Moses said no one can see God and what? Live. So it's not just that we can't physically see God, it's that no one can see God. Do you understand? In our present condition. I love it when unbelieving world, when I'm talking to them, evangelizing to them, talking to them about Christ, they say, well, you know, if God would just appear, then I would believe Him. And I said, He did. He came in the flesh and walked in this earth for three years. And you still don't believe. And so how do we know? How do we know if we can't see God so the dilemma becomes, you know, how do we know that we know God? How do we know that God knows us, right? No one has even seen God. Or for that matter, how are we, how are we ever going to convince an unbelieving world about God if they can't see Him? If they can't see an invisible God? And you say, well, that's easy, Pastor Sean, right? It's right there in verse 13. Look at verse 13. By this we know that we abide in Him and that He abides in us because He has given us the Spirit. There it is right there, right? That's how we know. Because God has given us the Spirit of God. Well, let me ask you this. Who here has seen the Spirit of God? No one. Okay. Why? Because the Spirit of God is Spirit. Even Jesus confessed in John chapter 3 that the Spirit blows where He wants to blow and He does what He wants to do. Right? We can see the effects of the Holy Spirit, but we can't see the Holy Spirit Himself. I mean, it's not like there's these magical feelings and these voices and this light show that comes with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Now, you'll get some that will say that. I've yet to see anyone prove that. Okay? I mean, the first century church could say that. Tongues of fire and all that kind of stuff. So how do we know that we have the Spirit of God in us? It can't just be by experience alone because no one here has physically experienced the power of the Holy Spirit or I should say physically uh, experienced the presence of the Holy Spirit. So how do we know that we know? We need, to, we need to be real about these things. You can't just tell people out in the world, look, if you believe in Jesus Christ, God promises to give you the, the Holy Spirit of God. How are they going to know? 
So this is why John is bringing this whole thing up to us. This is a big deal. I mean, even we go back to verse 12 for a moment. Look at this. I talked about this at the beginning of the sermon, right? Uh, John gives us another indicator that God abides in us. He says, no one has seen God at any time. He says, but if we love one another, God abides in us. We talked about love, right? So if we get, okay, well, no, we, we can't see the Holy Spirit. We don't know whether He's in us or not. We, we can't see God because God is invisible God. What about love if we love one another, right? And so we talked about that. We don't do that very well all the time. So what does that mean? Okay. And so this is why we need to know these doctrines are, are absolutely necessary. Because we're not always going to be able to discern the Spirit's work in our life. We're not always going to be able uh, to discern the way that we love one another, right? And so the whole point is that we cannot gauge our relationship with Christ based on experience alone. Do you understand? Because your experiences in real life sometimes are going to kind of seem to contradict what you know to be true about God's Word. Okay, think about it in terms of sinning. I talk about this a lot. Let's say that you have professed Christ, that you are uh, believing the word of God, you're believing the testimony of the gospel, all of those things are true of you, but your life goes in this direction that is in opposition to God. It happens to people, okay? Uh, just one day you wake up and you're on the wrong side of the bed, it's the first day of spring, okay? And you're unhappy, And so you go out and you beat up the world, which you know is in opposition to what God says. What are you going to believe about salvation in that moment? Because it's not what we believe about salvation when we're doing good. Do you understand? When we're doing good, everybody's good. We're like, oh, Jesus loves me and I love Him and the world is... But what about when you're sinning? What do you believe about the Word of God? Right? That's what we need to know. And so this is where John is taking us slowly but surely. We looked at a lot of these things already. But we can't have this this relationship by experience alone. We've never seen God. Uh, We've never seen the Holy Spirit. We don't always love as we ought to. So it's more than our confession. This relationship we have, this, this knowing is more than our confession. It's more than our experience. It's certainly more than our feelings and emotions. Because those don't always line up with the truth. And so thankfully, God did not leave us to our, on our own to figure this thing out, right? He has given us what? His Word. That is the greatest thing ever in the whole wide world. Do you understand that? Because when you are going in the wrong direction, right? You're having the bad day and you're thinking, gosh, how can I be saved and have this kind of attitude? Uh, The Bible comes along and says, the doctrines of Christ come along and says that you have been saved by grace alone through faith in Jesus Christ alone. That you have been eternally justified or made right with God, not by what you have ever done good or what you have ever done bad, but simply by trusting and believing in Christ and His Word. Wow. And that I know if I'm going in this direction, I can simply stop and say, you know what, Lord? I know that You came to this earth. You took on human flesh uh, to forgive me of my sins. And I do not make my plea on whether I'm going to be able to be good enough or bad enough. I make my plea simply on the blood of Christ that was shed on the cross. For me, that's the only argument I have. Do you understand? Okay. This is why it's imperative. I hate seeing believers in distress. Right? I don't know what's going on in my life. You know, where is God? If He says He loves me, then why does He let me do this? Okay? And so this is why we want to know this stuff. 
This is why the Apostle John has presented to us these tests of salvation. This is why the Apostle John has been so desperate uh, for us to know that we know that we have eternal life because God the Father wants us to know. Jesus Christ wants us to know. The Holy Spirit wants you to know. Look what Jesus tells us. I love this verse. This is one you can, another refrigerator magnet for you, right? If you're feeling depressed one day, you get up on the wrong side, I want you to look at this, right? Jesus said, no longer do I call you slaves for a slave does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you free. Friends, for all things that I have heard from my Father, I have what? Made known to you. The Creator of the universe wants you to know Him. He doesn't want us to pretend. He doesn't want us to play church. He doesn't want us to, to act like we've got it all together. What He wants us to do is to love and trust Him. That's what He wants us to do. And so let's read our verses. Verses 12 through 16, we're going to go through. So I'm going to keep it simple this morning. right? I hate getting on too many branches because then we, we don't come away with anything. And so we're going to stick to two things this morning. But let's read the verses. We'll pray. We'll go through this. Please read along with me. If you don't have your Bibles open, please open your Bibles. I keep telling people this all the time. When you read the Word of God, it totally transforms everything. You say, well, I'm a listener. No, you're not. You're a reader of the Word of God. Read the Word of God. It will change everything about your life. It just will. You were saved by the imperishable Word of God. Verse 12, No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and His love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us because He has given us His Spirit. Verse 14, We have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. And whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him and He in God. And we have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in Him. Let us pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we come to You. And really, we pray the prayers. We pray the prayer of Paul this morning, right? That we are praying and asking, Lord, uh, that we may be filled with the knowledge of Christ, right? With, with all spiritual uh, wisdom and understanding, right? So that we would walk in a manner worthy uh, of the Lord to please Him in all respects, bearing fruit, right? In every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Please let this be true of us this morning, that the Holy Spirit's work is not only in the teaching this morning, but also in the hearing, Father, in the receiving and the believing, Father. Uh, to the holding fast, to continuing, to persevering, to all of these things that you've called us to do as believers. Lord, let that be true in us this morning as we listen to your word. You are fabulous. You are beyond fabulous. You are indescribable to us. And Lord, we need your help. We don't love as we ought to, and we don't believe like we should, and we don't, we don't obey all these things all the time, Father God. And so we are desperate for you this morning. We are desperate for you um, to take hold of our lives. We love you, Jesus, and we're really learning to love you more and more each and every day. And so we pray all these things in your precious and wonderful name. Amen. Cool stuff. I got to tell you, man, some of these doctrines that we're going through this morning were like the most uh, wonderful things for me. Uh, in my Christian walk. When I first believed, there was nobody in my life at that time that would teach me these things. So I didn't know them. And as you can imagine, as a new believer, all of you maybe have had this experience as well, you don't feel like you're abiding in Christ. You certainly don't feel like Christ is abiding in you because all you're doing is failing one minute and day after another. It is just one big, gigantic failure from beginning to end. And all you feel like is that you are just, there, you, there's no way for you possibly to be saved because you're just, your thoughts are in opposition. Your, your actions are in opposition. Everything is a battle and a struggle for you. Nobody told you that when you put your trust in Christ that your life was going to become really difficult, right? Right? Usually you hear people say, well, you, if you believe Jesus, your life will get better. That's the biggest lie there ever is in the whole world. 
Right? Why? Because your old nature is now going to do battle with the truth. And so God is just, he promises from the beginning, here's what I'm going to do with you. This old nature, man, we got rid of that. We're giving you a new nature. And then this new nature is going to constantly do battle with the old nature. And so this thing is going to be a battle from start to finish, uh, start to finish. But take, take heart. Because for the first time in your life, you're alive. And you're doing battle. Okay? And so this is why these things, when I, I get to teach on these things, these are like, woo! These are just, wow. And so I'm going to keep this simple this morning because much of what we covered, we've already talked about in great detail already. Why? Because John keeps circling around back to the same things again. You know, walk in the light, uh, confess your sin, uh, love your brother, obey Christ. All these things that he's been talking about. And then he comes back around again and he says it again and again and again, right? Because he really wants us to know. But this particular section that we're looking at, the Apostle John gives us two primary evidences that God is abiding in us. That's our, that's our test. Is God abiding in us? He gives us two primary evidences, or you could say two primary evidences that God is dwelling in us. Or you could say two primary evidences that God um, is, oh, what's the word? I almost forgot it already. Uh, that God knows us. Let's just say that. Okay? How do we know that God knows us, right? We claim to know God, but how do we know that God knows us? That's what becomes most important. Remember, it doesn't do you any good to confess that you know God if He doesn't know you, right? You don't want to get to the end of the age and go, oh, yay, I have eternal life. I don't have any evidence of eternal life in my life, but now I'm going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And Christ says, I'm sorry, I have no idea who you are. Okay? We don't want that to happen. And so these things become super, super important. And so really, all of this is just a review of what the Apostle John has already revealed to us in the first, really, four and a half chapters. I mean, we see the same pattern, uh, the same pattern in, in back in chapter two. Let me read this to you. I want to show you this to you because I'm going to show you the pattern, and then we're going to talk about this pattern again. This is what John said back in chapter two. He said, by this we know that we have come to know Him, know God, right? If we keep His commandments. The one who says, I have come to know Him and does not keep His commandments is a liar and the truth is not in Him. But whoever keeps His word in Him, the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in Him. The one who says that He abides in Him ought Himself, ought himself to walk in the same manner as Christ walked. And so what I want you to see, I want you to pay attention to this, right? This is really a big deal to us. The first pattern or evidence that we see in this is that we believe Christ's word. That's the pattern. That's how you know that God abides in you is that you believe his word. That's the first thing uh, he told us back in chapter two, that we are keeping watch or guard over His commandments. Entele, don't get caught up in the word commandments. All that means is the Word of God. It's not the rules of God. Okay, If you love Christ, you're going to do what He what? He says. And so that's the evidence. That's the first evidence. The second pattern or evidence that we see is that we are going to respond or act on this truth. Okay, That's real life saving faith. Not only do we believe, but we also what? We respond, we go, right? That's the whole point. He says, uh, uh, look at the bottom part of that one there. He says that we're going to what? We're going to walk in the same manner as He walked. That's what's going to happen in your life. If God abides in you, the promise to you is that you're going to believe the Word of God, that you're going to respond to it, and you're going to begin to walk in a manner right that is consistent with Christ. That's how we know that God abides in us, right? That we're going to continuously be transformed into the image of Christ. That's God's promise uh, to you. That everyone who has been born of God, remember we talked about this a couple weeks ago, has been given a new nature. That you have been given a divine nature. That you have been given Christ's nature. Okay? And so you're going to begin to manifest God's nature in everything that you do. Okay? That's all John has been saying from the beginning, right? This indwelling of the Holy Spirit that causes us to begin to manifest the character and nature of Christ who is in us. Not a perfect life. That's not what John is telling you here. What he's telling you is that you're going to begin to live a surrendered life. Surrendered to what? Surrendered to the Word of God. That you're going to begin to live a sacrificial life. Or as I like to call it, or Paul calls it, a crucified life. What does a crucified life look like? Remember, John already talked about that, that we're going we're gonna to start putting away the things 
of the world. All the old treasures that we hung on to and we thought were so great and, and man, they were going to fulfill us and make us complete and make us happy. We begin to put those things away. Why? Because we're no longer attracted to them. We have something in our life that's way more attractive. Okay? And so we live this surrendered life. We live this crucified life. I mean, we already know that we can't claim to be without sin. We already learned that in chapter 1, right? We sin. Right? But we have an advocate with the Father in the Lord Jesus Christ who died for our sins, who constantly intercedes for us. Right? That's just, that's doctrine, folks. That's not feelings. That's not emotions. That's the doctrine of God on your behalf, right? And so, this is a life that is always surrendering to the Word of God and to the leading of the Holy Spirit. This is how we know God abides in us. And so we see the same pattern that we just saw in chapter 2. We see the same pattern in chapter 4 as John goes through this. Look at this with me, really. I want you to see the flow here. Pay attention to this. This is such a big deal for us. You want to know how you know? Right? Here it is right here. Verse 12. If we love one another, God abides in us, he says. Same exact pattern. In other words, the reason we will surrender to or respond to the Word of God is because God abides in us. We will begin to manifest the nature of Christ. What is the nature of Christ? Well, he already said it. God is love. He's the one that defines love. How does he define love? Well, Jesus not only talked about love, but he also did what? He demonstrated it when he went to the cross. Jesus didn't say, oh, I love you. He said, no, here's what love looks like, that I'm actually going to sacrifice myself in your place for the forgiveness of sins. That's what love is. And so if we love one another, God abides in us, right? Well, how do we know? We will love one another because God abides in us, right? That's who He is. How does God do this? Well, He does it through the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 13. Right? How does God abide in us? Well, He abides in us. He lives in us. He dwells in us through the Holy Spirit. Verse 13, because He has given us what? His Spirit. I can see you're really excited about that. <laughs> you know, the Holy Spirit is God. Co-equal in essence, nature, attributes. He is God. And so God dwells in you through the Spirit of God. How do we know that we have the Holy Spirit in us? Because of what we believe and confess. Look at verses 14 and 15. This is the flow. Right? God abides in you. How do you know He abides in you? Because He gives you a Spirit. How do you know you have the Spirit of God? Look at verses 14 and 15. Because we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son into the world to be the Savior. Right? That whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him and He in God. We make that confession. We're not talking about to people. I feel bad for you guys, and I don't mean to push back against this, and I don't want anybody's feelings to get hurt, but if you've ever attended a church that makes you stand up and confess, they're wrong. A public confession does nothing for you. The confession we're talking about right now is here. What do I really believe? Not what I'm trying to fake everybody out with, but what do I really believe? That's how we know we know, man. I don't want to play this game. I want to know what I really believe and I want to know that I believe it. I don't want to play around with this thing. So how do we know that we have the Spirit of God in us? Because we believe the Gospel of Christ, not just the details of the Gospel, but not just the intellectual understanding of the Gospel. I can tell you about the Gospel. Plenty of unbelievers in the world that can articulate the Gospel better than most believers. Remember we talked about this last week. Even the demons can articulate the Gospel better than most believers, and yet they are eternally condemned. Okay, so we want to make sure we know that we know, man, this is what it's all about right here. So it's, it's about believing, right? It's about trusting in the whole counsel of God, right? That not only do we believe the Word of God says about Jesus, right? That He is the Son of God, uh, that He came down from heaven, who eternally existed in heaven, came down from heaven, took on human flesh, and died on the cross uh, for the sins of the world, right? That's what we believe. But God also says we need to believe what, what God says about us. That we were born into sin, eternally condemned and separated from the love of Christ and had no way of rescuing ourselves. 
Those two things are primary doctrines of the Bible, doctrine of Christ and the doctrine of man. That out of love that God the Father sent the Son, right? God the Son into the world to die for the sins of the world that he might rescue us from eternal condemnation. That's what we believe. Do we hold fast to that? And I'm telling you folks, we have such a good God. Guess what he's going to do for you? He's going to put this to the test. Your whole walk he's going to put to the test. Pretty soon he's going to come and drag you out of church and have you killed so that you will know what you believe. Because historically speaking, right, it's happened in the church since the beginning. Christians have been slaughtered. Not because God doesn't care, but because he wants you to know. But because your life is going to begin to imitate Christ's life. So if you're in here faking this thing today, guess what the people out there who kill Christians do? They don't care. They don't care whether you're a faker. They'll kill you along with everybody else as well. Okay? And the only way you're going to know is in that moment. The only way you're going to truly know is in that moment. When everything in your body wants to flee. When everything in your body wants to hide. When everything in your body wants to be quiet. You're going to know. Okay? Well, how do you can say that, Pastor Sean? Because Jesus Christ promised it to us. He said, don't worry about what you say when they come and drag you off. The Holy Spirit will give you what you say and He will what? He will strengthen you. I don't have the strength right now. I'm big sissy right now. But the promise for me is when they come and get me, I'm going to be strengthened by the Spirit of God. And so that's what I rely on. Why? Because it's the Word of God. It doesn't matter how I feel. That's what the Word of God says. And so through this new birth, right? Through this regeneration of the Holy Spirit, God takes up residence in us, the Bible says. That He actually physically dwells in us, right? Uh, that we will never abandon the truth. We will never depart from the truth. And we will always uh, proclaim and live this truth. Why? Because we have the Holy Spirit in us. That's the whole point that He's making, right? Remember we saw this last week that it is impossible for the unbelieving world to know God. Why? Because they don't have the Spirit of God in them, right? Because these things only come from uh, the revelation of the Holy Spirit or the teaching of the Holy Spirit. Look at our verses as we go through them, right? But the natural man, that's just another word for unbeliever. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for they are foolishness. I mean, anybody not agree with the Word of God? The world thinks that Christianity is totally a joke. Okay? They think you're a joke. They think it is foolishness. That's so stupid to believe in that stuff. I got a portfolio, bro. You guys are believing in some invisible God. I've heard them all, man. <laughs> but you won't be invisible for long. Okay? And so it says they can't believe it because it's foolishness and they cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. Give me the next one, Audrey. This is Jesus' promise, right? He says, I will ask the Father and He will give you another helper that He may be with you forever. That is the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see Him or know Him, but you know Him because He what? There's our word again. He abides in you. He remains in you. How do you know He remains in you? Because you're what? You're going to begin to believe the Word of God and you're going to begin to act on that Word. You're going to respond to it. You're going to begin to live the life that Christ has for you. And so the first evidence that God abides in us is what we confess, right? And by what we continue to believe according to the truth of God's Word. It's not just believing in space. We don't believe in believing. Are you with me? We don't have faith in faith. That's not salvation. We have faith in a person. Okay? Very specific in Scripture. When people go, you just got to have faith. I just want to like, I don't know, Christian slap them. Whatever that looks like. We don't have faith in faith, folks. Okay? That's what the world does. That's why you've got Lord of the Rings and, and all the other goofy shows out there, right? We have faith in a person, faith in Christ alone. That's what we have faith in. Okay? 
How do I know I'm a Christian? Because God gave me a spirit and he only gives a spirit to those who are his and the Holy Spirit only dwells in those who have been born of God. How do I know God gave me the spirit, right? Verse 14, because we testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Verse 15, and we believe that Jesus is the Son of God and God abides in him and he in God. In other words, we believe the gospel of Christ, which is impossible to believe if you don't have the spirit of God in you. I love it. Super simple. But you can't have the first evidence, right? That we believe the Word of God without the second evidence, which is God abides in us because we begin to respond to the very gospel that we believe. Okay? And John's not going to get specific here, but I can tell you just from experience where he's going with this. We'll get to it in a minute because some of you are going to be like, oh, wait a minute. So it's not just our confession, right, alone, but rather it's our confession combined with our response. In other words, uh, we're going to begin to love like Christ loved because he abides in us. Look at verse 16, please. And we have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. What is the love that God has for us? That he sent his one and only begotten son into the world to what? Die for us that whoever believes in Him might have eternal life. That is, we believe the love that God has for us. Because God is love. He is the definition. And the one who abides in love, the one who loves, abides in God and God abides in Him. Look, there's three witnesses here if you look at it. Uh, verse 15, right? This is our witness that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then if you look at what uh, verse 13, uh, there's the Holy Spirit's witness that we believe God, right? That's His witness to us. Look, you guys believe this stuff. You're not just playing a game. You believe it. And then there's the witness of Christ uh, through the believers. Look at verse 14. There's the witness of Christ through believers that God is love and that He sent His Son into the world. What is that? That's evangelism, isn't it? That's how God is going to work through you. He's going to, this love that you have that is, that is abiding in you and you are abiding in it, that's going to be, uh, begin to pour out into the world. Remember, love is a verb. It's a doing word. It's an act of the will, not a feeling or an emotion. Are you with me? Doesn't mean God doesn't want you to have feelings or emotions. I've had that rebuke before, so i got to have that little asterisk there every time I say that. But it means that God is love is an action word. We don't just love in word, but we love in what John said, word and deed. Okay, That's how you know what love is. Remember, Jesus not only preached the love of God, but He also demonstrated it when He went to the cross. He demonstrated it when He was hanging on the cross. Can you imagine if you were the creator of the universe and that you can breathe out the world in one breath and destroy the world in one breath? Can you imagine about halfway through that ordeal on the cross if you were God? I mean, I know I would. I'd be like, okay, I'm done with this. Everybody's dead. Bring on the rain clouds and the fog and the tornadoes. So if there's any physical evidence, right, that Christ abides in us, if we want to know physically if Christ is abiding in us, uh, the way that we can know that is by the way that we imitate Christ. Remember, we are the gospel to the world. Jesus came uh, to seek and save the lost. And so then he was crucified to make that happen, ascended into heaven, sent the Holy Spirit down to you and me who will believe so that we would continue seeking and saving the lost. Are you with me? Okay, That's what it means to have the love of God abide in you. It's not a feeling, it's a what? It's an action. It's a mission. It is your purpose in this life. God didn't take you home right away because He wants you to live in this imperfect world imperfectly so that you could prove to the world that God, right, saves by faith in Him through grace, right? Because we live by grace. 
And so that's what he does for us, right? Look at verse 16. Why? Why does he do this? Why do we imitate Christ? Because we have come to know him and believe the love which God has for us. If we abide in Christ, we will abide in his love. If we abide in his love, we will share that love with others. And, and, and whenever we share this love, it's going to be proof to us on the inside that we are abiding in Christ or more importantly, that Christ is abiding in us. In other words, there's no separation uh, between what's happening to us on the inside and what we are proclaiming on the outside. So many times I've had this conversation. And maybe we're not talking about perfection here. Please listen to me. Because all of us have failed miserably at some times at this, right? We know that we should speak and we don't. We're in a situation and we fail miserably. We see a place where God is working and we don't join him in his work. And what we end up doing is running away because we don't want to have the confrontation. Okay? And so this is a big deal. Man, we understand that. We go, gosh, there was an opportunity uh, to talk about the love of Jesus Christ and I just, I cared more about my reputation than I did Christ's reputation. And so this isn't what John's talking about here. What John's talking about here is when we just don't ever have this at all. That's what he's talking about. You just never talk about it. In fact, you're kind of ashamed of it. I don't want to talk about that because if they hear that what I think I believe, then they're going to be really. You know, what did Jesus say, right? Pretty powerful words. Jesus said, For whoever is ashamed of me and what? My words. The Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father uh, and of the holy angels. And I talked to people about this, man. You know, Pastor Sean, how do I know that I believe? How do I know that I'm saved? How do I know that God abides in me? What comes out of you? Is it the love of God? Is that your constant compulsion in this world is to share the love of God with everybody that you know? I'm not talking about being a moron. Okay? I'm talking about God is constantly presenting you opportunities to display this to someone that you know and you don't. Okay? We're not talking about putting on a sandwich board and, you know, everyone's going to hell. Okay? We're talking about truly displaying the love of Christ to those around you. That we, you know, the the Psalm 30 it is, the psalmist says that I cannot be silent Jeremiah says, I I love it, Jeremiah 20, I don't know if you've ever read, he's one of the prophets, right, who saved nobody. Priest of thousands, nobody came to salvation, okay? He says, you know what, you duped me, Father God, right? You duped me into this. You said that I was going to go out and be a preacher and that it was going to bring glory to you and I preached to everybody and and nobody believes me. In fact, I've been a laughing stock and they make fun of me. They threw me in prison. They threw me into a well and they, they hate me. You lied to me about this job, is what he says. But then he says, but you know what? I tried to be quiet. I tried to be silent. And I couldn't. It just keeps pouring out of me. Just keeps pouring out of me. And so this is the thing, right? This is what John wants you to know. Boy, you want to know. You want to be assured of this thing, right? One of the things that we've been talking about on Friday nights is that life produces life. That's what Jesus said in John 3 to Nicodemus, didn't he? The flesh produces what? Flesh, but the Spirit produces what? The Spirit. In other words, life produces life. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and what? The life. And nobody comes to the Father except what? Through me. And so it's this life that produces life, right? Uh, If Christ is living in you, you should you should begin to reveal this life to everyone around you. I mean, first of all, you receive the life of Christ. That's what the Bible says. And then you begin to display that life to everyone around you. Last thing we're going to look at real quick. We got time. Ephesians. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. I want you to see this. I I want you to see your whole life in one chapter. Um... Ephesians chapter 2, verse, verse 10 verses. Oh man, I gotta get my glasses. Oh, getting old. 
Uh, although it was really cool a couple weeks ago, I was talking to one of the preschool moms, uh, actually witnessing to her, uh, me and Miss Lori. We were giving her the gospel of Christ, right? Talking to her about the love of God. And she said, and I mentioned that I had a 36-year-old son. She goes, you don't look like you have a 36-year-old son. She goes, you look like maybe you're like in your early 40s. And I was like, hey, wow. <laughs> come back and see me tomorrow. In fact, every day when you come in. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 2, I want you to see that life produces life. Which means you have to understand what you were, what we believe before Christ, right? He says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working the sons of disobedience. What does that mean? It means that before Christ, you were dead. Okay, You weren't barely alive. Yeah, I like people use that analogy of people in the ocean, right? This is your life before Christ that you were, you were stranded in the ocean on this life preserver. No, the Bible says that you were at the bottom of the ocean being eaten by fish and incapable of doing anything but laying there and being dead. Okay, that's what it means to be dead. Okay, do you understand? That's what you were. Uh-oh. You were following the prince of the power of the air. Who is that? Satan, right? Satan is the one who rules over the whole world, okay? Because God gave him permission to. And so everybody that does not belong to Christ is under his dominion, is under his influence. Let's put it that way. And it's in verse 3. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh. Remember, that's our old desires. We were indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. In other words, uh, that's the way we used to live. Those were the things that we loved, and we were all children of wrath. Everybody who is born is born into sin and is by nature a children of wrath. There's no good people in the beginning who go bad. It's everything is bad from the very beginning. He says, but God, I love that. But God, listen to this. This is who you are now. He says, but God being rich in mercy because of his great what love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He made you alive. Life produces what? Life. So if he made you alive and you are seated with him in the heavenly places, you're going to begin to be what? Alive. You're no longer dead, which means those old desires are going to pass away and you're going to begin to have these new desires and you're going to begin to imitate and display the nature of Christ in you. That's what he says. Listen to this. We're not done yet. So to the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Jesus Christ. I love that verse. Anyway, he's going to take your imperfect life the fact that you don't do very well all the time, and he's going to use it to display to the rest of the world that I save my people by grace alone and not by what they do, either good or bad. Oh! It's not an excuse to be imperfect, okay? Don't go home and say, we can do whatever we want, Pastor Sean said. No. Because you no longer want to do that stuff. Verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not as a result of works. Why? So that no one would be able to say, look, God loves me because I'm such a great Christian. Verse 10, here it comes. We have such a good God. For we are His workmanship. We were created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand. What does that mean? Before the foundations of the world. Okay? Before the foundations of the world, God prepared beforehand for you to do good works. And all you have to do, look at the end of the verse, is what? Walk in them. That's it. That's your entire life in a nutshell. 
You were this, but you're not that anymore. Why? Because God made you alive again. What's going to happen? You're going to begin to walk in that life. And what happens when you begin to walk in that life? You're going to begin to do the things, the very things that God had already prescribed for you to do from before the foundations of the world. All you have to do is continue to walk in them. And through walking in them, through that demonstration of God's love, you are going to have confidence and assurance that God is abiding in you. How do you know? Because everyone who does not have God abiding in them will not not do those things. Simple as that. Does it make sense? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank You. So much here, Lord. And you know, I, uh, I wish I could be more articulate enough, Father God. I wish I could know all the fancy words and all the things that, you know, there is to say that would be uh, convincing or that would be whatever uh, needs to happen, Father God. But I also realize that there's nothing that I can say, no matter how articulate, no matter how uh, smart I would like to be, Father God, that there's nothing that we can say that can make any difference. This is the reason we have passages like this, because the only thing that saves is 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 Christ. The only thing that can uh, cause a person to be born again, the only thing that can cause a person to believe the Word of God, to understand the Word of God, to hold fast to the Word of God is the Holy Spirit Himself. And so, Lord, I surrender to that. Um, I surrender to... I surrender to that this morning. But I'm also praying too, Father, if there's someone in here this morning that doesn't know Christ... Because it sounds ominous, Lord. It sounds like it's impossible to be saved. We just have to sit around and wait for the Holy Spirit to work. But that's not what you said. You said everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, everyone who believes the Word of God, everyone who trusts in Christ will be saved. It's as simple as that. And so, Lord, I'm praying for that this morning, that everyone here that doesn't know Christ or at least is not sure right now, Father, because of the things that we talked about, that you would draw them to yourself and that they would fall down on their knees uh, when they get home and they would just plead before you that they don't have to make any presentation before men. All they have to do is just surrender and, and, and give their life to you, Father God, to, to, to believe the Word of God, to, to trust in Christ and to walk in it, just as we saw it, just to walk in it imperfectly, uh, extremely slow however that looks, Father God, but they would begin to walk in it and they would begin to proclaim that to everyone else. Please, Lord, let that be true. Um, you know, there's nothing. We talked about no one has seen God that uh, seen the glory of God. And so, Lord, um, that's just not true sometimes because we do see your glory in your word. We do see your glory in the things that you have done. And so I pray that that would be the thing that sticks in us this morning. Oh, that we would love you, Lord, that we would love you, that we would love you, that we would love you. And so we thank you for all of these things this morning. We pray this in your wonderful name. Amen.